Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Barry Mazer. He's going to talk about Ralph Peer helping recording artists get royalties. You know, if you're here in Nashville, the greatest thing that can ever happen to you, and as a songwriter, I think you'll empathize with this idea, it's called mailbox money. <laughs> this is, you know, it's a bit like if you're an actor in a TV show from years ago or in a TV commercial, and they show it in 500 markets, and it turned out the way your contract was done. This is not necessarily the case, but if you got a contract that says so, if someone took care of you right, you're going to get paid every time that sucker runs, and not just nationally, but in um, you know Spokane and Terre Haute and uh, Altoona. There is an equi- a kind of equivalent for record people who record songs and much, much better for people who write songs because that deal has long since better. And people who have been around in, in the popular music business any amount of time discover all the money is in publishing. This is why the guy in the band who doesn't have his name on the songs discovers his best buddy is making 10 times as much as he does and bands break up. I mean, there's only two things that break up bands, which is failing or succeeding. So, <laughs> yeah. um, and one of the ways you succeed is somebody makes a lot of money with royalties from songs. So it wasn't always the case, and they didn't always get paid. It took a succession of things because music publishers wanted to pay people as little as possible. In the case of people in the music that I've been writing about for 50 years this year, Roots music, if you're in country, if you're in blues, if you're in bluegrass, if you're in, you know, folk, any of these areas, gospel, any of these areas that are not sort of mainstream Tim Pan Alley and Broadway history operetta, if you're not that, if you're not what ASCAP cared about, I could go into that, that's a whole other discussion, but if you're not that mainstream kind of stuff, they didn't want you at all. Not least the publishers didn't because most people who play that music can't read music anyway. Who's going to buy the sheet music? That was their thing. So there was no money in it. And I hate to tell people, but a lot of this is about making money. So it's a business, you know, that's a, right. Singing on your porch is not a business. As soon as you play in public for other people, let alone want to have a song published, you're in show business. Now, the guy I wrote about, Ralph Peer, was one of the fundamental people in making that so. And the reason was simple. I mean, they weren't taking care of him either. If you were, there was grandfathered, which publishing companies would actually have, get paid higher rates for the use of their songs in shows and in broadcasting in the early days of radio. And, the, and there's a publishing part that's attached to records. It's what people call the mechanicals. Another whole long-winded discussion I won't go into right here. But there's publishing on every record, which is separate from making money from sales of the record, from the recording. It's a separate thing because every one of those songs was written and published by somebody and they have the copyright on the material, not the recording. They, They weren't very interested in the early days of recording of having anybody but their star artists record a song so they'd have it alone. This was incredibly short-sighted because of the way the song copyright laws worked as early as 1909. And Ralph Peer, working for other people, Columbia Records, OK Records in his early days, before the ones people hear about, RCA, RCA Victor Records after Bristol, you know, they know that. And he set up the Pierce Southern Music Company. Well, before all of that, he got a good taste of the way writers were treated. And, you know, and also the fact that they weren't being what the publishing industry calls service, which is taking care of you as a writer and trying to maximize what you can make out of that song. And he was saying, if you do this right, and this is basically the idea that made commercial country music work, He was doing it with blues first. But he said, basically, if you have the right song, which might be a song about getting loaded and going to jail if you're Jimmy Rogers, and it's about your total loyalty to your family and going to church if it's the Carter family, and neither of these things may have been, these may have been limited connection to the actual life of either of these people, (laughs) but, but it's the way they were being sold. It was the identity of the performer and the nature of the song. 
But if you did that right, that song could be used by a whole bunch of people. And this is why, you see, when Jimmy Rogers' songs came out, they were recorded by Gene Autry. They were recorded by 8, 10, 12 people on all these different labels. It didn't hurt Jimmy Rogers at all. In fact, the money flowed into him from all these other recordings, which is why he was soon driving Cadillacs and living in a mansion in Texas. Now, he spent it all, but it was coming in. And also, Ralph Peer did something not everybody in publishing did. He actually saw that he got their percentage. Now, people hear these stories about, uh, you know, they got paid... They got paid $50 for that session. First of all, you have to realize what $50 was to a working staff, you know, an unemployed farmer in 1927. It was a considerable amount of money. The other thing, as I say, I've been interviewing musicians for 50 years, hundreds of them, and one of the things I've never heard anybody say was, I got paid too much for that. <laughs> that's right in there with, I, I, you know, that's what I got too much recognition for that. These are the things you, you don't hear. <laughs> so, so the question people ask is, why did Ralph Peer decide to do this out of, the, out of the generosity of his heart? Well, there was a little of that, but not much. It was a practical decision because nobody else was bothering to really pay them those royalties. The, there was a royalty. The law said that they were, they, they were due, which is really a couple cents on a record, at most half a cent on a record, which for most people was not going to change your life. But if you're selling half a million records like Jimmy Rogers or even, you know, a couple hundred like the Carters, oh, it will change your life. The, the music industry doesn't look at a, at a copyright as like you wrote the song. The, I, I would say it's like, it's like you make a claim. It's like the gold rush. You, know, it doesn't, you, you, know, or it, you found the gold, you got a claim on that spot. Or this house, you know, we paid the mortgage, we finally owned this house, took long enough. We owned this house. It doesn't suggest that we were the architect. <laughs> it means we own the house. <laughs> so it's, that's the way the music business looks at a copyright on a song. So what Peer did, and, and, you know, the publishers weren't in a rush to do. This is why you hear complaints is, I am going to pay them. It's the minimum, in most cases, the minimum of what the law says they should do. But I'm going to actually do it. And it's going to give me a leg up. My artists are going to want to come do this again. He had a personal relations with him. He did the things that meant as a publisher... And this would especially hold as, you know, he was a famous A&R man doing all these recording sessions for, the, for, for Victor and the labels. But if, when in the Depression, the record business just bottomed out and, you know, publishing kept going. He said, well, what am I going to do with, they didn't know if it was ever going to come back because there was this horrible thing called radio, which if you, you know, once you, if you bought a radio, you never had to buy a record again. Everybody knew that because it was streaming free over the airwaves. Well, just like we knew with the current streaming. Yeah, so that was the feeling. And, the, and, and all the record companies were against radio because how could that ever do anything for you? Well, that got figured out. It could do everything for you, but it took a while to figure that out. And so they were against it at first. And he took the next step. He was shunned because of who he was recording. ASCAP was the old line thing. He had a few artists that, would do, that were in that area. But he's, you know, they had no interest in the Carter family or, or, or Fats Waller, who he's recording, or, or Mamie Smith and Booth, you know, all these people he's recording, or gospel groups. Is, it's, well, what's that? We said, that, no point publishing those songs. And he said, well, you know, we should do that. We should do that. He set up a publishing company, and at first, he... Victor said, he said, I'll, you know, I'll take next to no money. People, the, the, the story always goes, he took no money from Victor. It's very briefly true. I said, I'll just take the mechanical. So those records are selling at first in 1927, 28, before the Depression hit. And he made like, he was making like 500000 a you know, a half off of that stuff. And, well, they put an end to that really fast. <laughs> like, this, guy, this guy's not even on our payroll. He's a consultant, and he's making more money than... So, because he realized it, and they didn't. The record companies just didn't get this. And, and, and the songs are being sold to all these other companies, meanwhile, because they're really being serviced, which he knew they wouldn't do. So for a while, they bought his publishing company, <laughs> so they get it. But he still had the incentives because he got a percentage of those royalties. But the singers kept getting them. The, the, the point 
of no return for those singers was this problem with roots music. So we got to the 1940s towards World War II, and this was still going on, and he was now a full-time publisher. He got out of the, of the recording business. He was a publisher. He started, to, he started to duplicate it worldwide, he started to do for Latin music what he'd done for Hillbilly and all the Latin music in those movies from the World War II. And after that's all because of him. They were dancing to Besame Mucho in China and Leningrad because he took those songs everywhere, same way. But the point was they wouldn't play these things on the they weren't they wouldn't play these things on the radio to speak of and if they did they weren't paying anybody so he got together with the broadcasters and he said you know instead of being uh, put under the gun by ASCAP every every few years when the contract comes up why don't you just do that on your own uh, why don't you do that on the own he knew some lawyers he knew them and they did it and that was called Broadcast Music International. BMI, which is, you would have seen, we would have seen growing up in all our time on all the blues records, all the country records to speak of, all the bluegrass records. And you know what? Most of the rock and roll records when it got here were BMI because he set up a way for people in these sort of despised and unvalued genres to get paid to. And the fact that people like a lot, make a lot of money or even a little money as a country songwriter, and R&B, too. I mean, all these areas where there got to be money, he opened that up, bluegrass, and the royalties come in on the publishing as well as the records. And that's your mailbox money. <laughs> 